You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we're joined by Mike Winnett. And Mike, on his Twitter bio, calls himself a working class lad that sold a business for £8 million. Mike, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good? Yeah, very good. Good on this, what day is it? Wednesday morning. Um, Trying to get back into the rhythm of things. Mike, typical fashion of the show, we spend the first three, four minutes getting to know the individual on the show, and then we go into all the good things. Not your typical sales podcast, as I said before, and I don't want you to sound like a parrot. So you grew up in Warrington. For anyone who's not familiar with that, that's kind of halfway between Liverpool and Manchester in the UK. Yeah. Any favourite stand-up memories of your time growing up there? Uh, No, just like good, honest, working-class people, I would say. Um, It's... Well, I've lived all over, actually. So I was born in Germany. My dad's in the army. So I used to move around when I was younger quite a lot. But my dad's from Warrington. So when I, as I got older, I ended up moving up here and staying here away from my family. And then since I've lived here, my mum and dad have come back, my brother come back and my sister come back. So I kind of moved back here on my own uh, after spending a lot of time here as a kid. So uh, it's just a, it's, I like it. Good for airports, good for Liverpool, good for Manchester best place i've lived in the uk and i've lived in a lot of places so nice you talked about your your dad uh and growing up a part of your life in germany people can usually point to a handful of people that have had a, a impact on their who they've become today from their early years whether a parent a teacher an acquaintance does anybody spring to mind for you um i would say it, it it's a bit later in life really rather than early years i'd say the biggest impact on my early years was I went to boarding school age seven. I was the only one out of my siblings that went to boarding school. And that was, I asked to go because I didn't like going to school in Germany. And I then went from being in an army background. I think my dad was a sergeant at the time or a corporal at the time. I can't remember. Um, to going into a school that you had to pay to go to. The forces actually contribute to some of the cost of your living, uh, of you going to boarding school. So I was surrounded by children whose parents earned a significantly more amount of money than my parents. So I was around from age seven, children of business owners. So I I was had a different upbringing to my uh, siblings and my parents. And I think that's probably why I always believed I'd have my own business. So I'd say early years, it was going to boarding school was the biggest impact and influence on what shaped me. And then in my later years, actually believing that I could go and set up my own business and be successful was um, a guy that I worked for called Martin Machen. He was a BT local business franchise owner. And he basically said to me, you're better than this role that we've got for you here now. Go and do your own thing. And if it doesn't work out, you can come back and work for me anytime. So I'd say those those two events were the two biggest things sort of that impacted my sort of startup and business life, I'd say. Do you always want to get into business when you're growing up? Uh, I always thought I would have my own business. My nan tells me that I said I'd be a millionaire when I was a, a kid. I don't remember saying that, I, but I think that's a lot. Of, I think that's something that, with hindsight, a lot of people say that you said. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. I was always an entrepreneur in school because I sold chocolate bars or I sold cigarettes. Now, I did both those things, but it wasn't thinking like an entrepreneur. It was just to have a few bit of extra money to buy some uh, cider at the weekends and stuff like that so yeah and are you are you the only one in your family who's in business you mentioned you were the only one who went to boarding school yeah so my sister weirdly has actually got her own recruitment company she started that up about three four years ago she's working recruitment and my brother is a fighter and also pt so he kind of worked for himself but you know it's don't tell the tax man cash in hands traveling around doing pads for people and stuff like that so excellent Mike, I'd like to rewind the clock back to, I don't know what year it was when you sold that business for £8 million, but that's not important. It's uh, and it's a business you build with your mates. There's there's tons of blind spots in businesses when you're trying to scale a business, not paying attention to lead generation, not building the bench, not having a hiring process. When you look at early stage businesses now, having sold one, uh, think of early stage businesses that have the goal of selling a business what are some of the common blind spots that you see them fall victim to where they could get a better uh price for sale yeah well the, the first thing i would say before that is and you've said that is so many businesses don't have that end goal in sight so if you don't even think about potentially who you could sell the business to 
why they would want to buy you, how you could complement a potential buyer's existing business. Um, they're the three things that I say a lot of people, because I've got um, a group now where I deal with a lot of startup people in uh, startups and that have their own business, but like a little online community. And I would say so few people have got that end goal in sight. So they don't actually know what they're trying to achieve. So that's the biggest thing first. And then I would sort of drill down into that. I'd say the biggest blind spot really is who would want to buy you and why? Can that business run without you or are you integral to that business? That's a huge thing. I think people don't realize um, sacking myself was one of the first things that I tried to do. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but when we sold that business, I didn't want to do a workout. So I replaced myself in that business. So when I was going through that sale process, I could say, look, here is your MD. Here is your head of sales. Here is your head of marketing. Here is your head of customer service. This business runs without us. And number one, it meant that I could negotiate better terms when it did come to the sale. But there's stuff like you need to look around and see what other businesses that are getting huge multiples are doing. And a lot of businesses are bought now on um, recurring revenues. So if you've not got a business that's got a recurring revenue model, you want to start to look to implement that as soon as possible or have a certain element of revenue that is recurring revenue because that helps get a bigger multiple. And then who potentially could buy you. Now we started the business with a three-year plan. So it was a three-year plan to sell the business for 10 million on a set date. And then we worked back from that goal. So it was like, so if we wanted to get that figure six months before then, who would we need to be um, engaging with and who could potentially buy us? Then six months before that, how do you get on their radar? So I, I backwards planned yeah. pretty much the whole business down to then you could go to your quarter, your annual, your quarterly, your monthly, and your weekly sales targets based on, well, I know it needs to be worth 10 million. We need to have X number of clients paying X price per month by this point. And that's when we'd get the valuation. So I would say the backwards plan is the key thing. Also the recurring revenue and also knowing who and why they would buy you. So we were smart very early in the process, but because we knew we wanted to sell in three years, we basically listed our competitors and people that complemented our business. So uh, my business, for those that don't know, was an online um, training business. However, we just made content. So we made content that would then work in other people's training systems, So, which was a smart move because most competitors in our industry at that, that time or people in that industry wanted to create a huge system, a dead expensive system that, I don't know, say, Mother Care, Halfords, the Football Association, whoever it might be, would then buy this £100,000 system and then fill it with content. So a lot of companies try to do the content and the system together. We were smart. We made the content that would work in anybody's systems, so which then meant, number one, our buying process was a lot easier. It wasn't a case of you need to learn a whole new system. It was just plug our stuff into your existing stuff anyway. It will work. So there was that. So we were kind of like, uh, Microsoft, instead of building computers, they built the software that went on everyone's computers. It was the, That was the kind of the model that we had. So we went, who could we complement? So then we had loads and loads of businesses we could work with, and we tried to look at creating partnerships, strategic partnerships with them. And then we looked at content creation companies that we could then compete with. So it was, why don't we proactively and aggressively target their market base, uh, their client base, sorry, then the thinking behind that was on this side, you had people that potentially might want to buy your business to protect their own because they were losing so many clients to you. And on this side, you had pe people that potentially wanted to buy your content because it complemented their business so well. And they wouldn't want their competitors who were also to have our content. So we thought if we make, if we just made the best learning content out there, we'd either have people that would buy us to protect their business or buy us to complement their business. So potentially we had two different sales strategies ongoing throughout the whole three years. And that was the key thing I felt to us because then you could easily bring um, multiple offers to the table mm. um, and you weren't kind of, so we had, we had options and that was probably the, the smartest thing, but it, again, with hindsight, we could have done things a, a, a lot better and a, a bit more aggressive and we could have been a bit, better with scaling the business however the actual foundations and what our beliefs were was was solid 
and that worked really well. So that's my biggest advice to anybody is think of who would buy you. And a lot of them will be competitors. So you actually want to get on competitors' radar quite early. So we used to do campaigns where we would go on our competitors' website, look at their testimonials and just contact them. And like that, you know, it's your competitors give you so much information. So if someone's bought a similar product to yours and they've got that as their testimonial and you know your product's better, go after them. And that's what we did. Um, and we did really well. Uh, yeah, smart. Paul Paul Fifield um, of the Sales Impact Academy has built a number of businesses and he says his one regret in his previous businesses is, is not building a reoccurring revenue uh, stream business. Yeah, it's, it's funny business. actually, I, I preach this now and I'm saying this to you now, but unfortunately I've got, I've got a business now, I call it an accidental business that I set up during lockdown that makes content for businesses. So it makes, it's like a content marketing business yeah. of, uh, create videos and animations and animated explainer videos and stuff like that. It's called I Am Productions. That isn't a recurring revenue business. And it annoys me so much that I'm actually on, I've got one business that doesn't follow the model that I absolutely preach to all of my um, people in my business group. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you want to build something once and get paid for it many times. Like that's the dream. And um, we've got a, a sign on the wall of that says bespoke is bullshit. If you, if it takes you, so for us now, if it takes me a week to make a video for one client, that's one client paying me say 500 pound or a thousand pound, whatever it might be. However, in my old business, Learning Heroes, I'd make one video per week. Well, it was like one training course per week and 340 people paid 500 pound a month. So which one's better? But it was the same amount of effort. It was the same script writer, same voiceover yeah. artist, same animator. We just got 300, well, 299 times more money for it in the other business model. And that's why that model is so good. And that's why I definitely preach recurring revenue. Um, you, yeah. you, you, you just touched on learning heroes, the, the training business. And as I was getting ready for this podcast, I was, I was thinking of obviously familiar with the training world you are. Um, and there's a lot of, not a lot. There's some business businesses or sales leaders that view, training as a tick the box exercise there's a large corporate company uh blue logo you probably guess who it is uh where they've come to trainers that i know and it said we want to do uh a session on insert x topic prospecting whatever it is we've got 100 people to do it for are you free on x day yeah and then the trainers will come to them and say it's, it's actually probably better off dividing this i'll charge the same amount but it's probably better off dividing this into four groups so there's 25 so that the groups get more attention and they have, have the opportunity to ask more questions and the same answer was back from each leader that no we're trying to make this a bit of a pr event and uh to make a bit of a rura about it um with that in mind what do you think can be done to make the experience of learning better well it's an interesting question actually um so we were quite disruptive i hate using that word because it's a bit of it's banded about so much now but we were quite disruptive in that industry at the time or that sector at the time because how we priced and structured our model anyway but so um ours we didn't charge per course didn't charge per head it was like literally you pay 500 pound a month and you get unlimited access so no matter if you've got ten thousand staff or 100 staff this is the price. So in a strange way, the bigger companies saw more value in it. So it was actually easier for us to sell to some of like the blue chip companies in the UK. Um, but our tagline was saving the world from boring and learning. So it was an online training um, uh, content. And we openly admitted that e-learning is probably the worst type of learning. Real learning happens through experience and going into um, putting stuff into practice. Yeah. So we actually, even though we made e-learning, acknowledged that it was probably the least important part of your training um, that you would get on the job. So on the job training is better, um, experience, you know, shadowing people, those types of things we felt was the best way of learning. So number one, a lot of people in our industry didn't like that, but it also meant that we had a great USB to say, look, we know a lot of this is a box ticket exercise, exercise and who wants to sit at a computer for three hours doing multiple choice questions? That's why all of our e-learning was less than five minutes. And our, our, our concept was, how do you learn at home? You either go on Google to type a question in, or you go on YouTube to type a question in, and you will probably pick the shortest video. 
So it might be, how do I set my Sky Digi, Digi box? Or how do I uh, roast the chicken? You would go on YouTube, find it, and it'd be 90 seconds to tell me. So we just made e-learning like that. So we would then say, once you've introduced a concept, then they can go and put that into practice on the shop floor or um, when the next dealing with customers or when the next set of sales meeting, and they can learn on the job and they can shadow people. So we kind of said it's a small part of a, um, of a learning um, model. Yeah. Now, when it comes to those big types of businesses, what they need to realize is people learn in different ways. So there's no point forcing 100 people into a classroom or 100 people to sit in front of an e-learning module. What they need to do is just get their interest, just spark someone's interest. So what we were clever when we did, we knew this was a, an issue with a lot of businesses and uptake, especially when we could look at the stats from people's um, systems. Most people don't want to do a time management course, don't want to do a working at heights course. They don't want to. So we thought real life examples, what are people in general? They're selfish, aren't they? So we used to create a 30 second trailer for every training course to give to the learning team or the training team in a business to advertise their training. So they could put it on their internal systems. They could send it out. They could email it to people, but it would be a trailer. And it was always what's in it for me. So it was from the, the actual learner's perspective. So say if we did a working at heights training course, that was mandatory, everyone had to do it. We would make a 30 second trailer, which would be a guy falls off a roof. Then it shows like, you know, he can't work for six months. He's not got insurance. How much money does his family earn? How does it impact his business? So we would do that as there's the buy-in. So now I'm thinking, shit, I probably need to do this course because look at the impact it could have on me and my family, my potential ends if I don't do it, rather than, I used to get an email, do this course. So you jump on in the middle of work, you didn't even know what it was. And sometimes I'd say, so the answer's a BBD and you'd, you'd click through it, BBD, 100% pass. So we do that. So we'd always do a trailer. But then what we realized as well is people learn in different ways. So at first, when we started the business, we just made an e-learning module. But then we got some people that said, can I just have the clips without the questions that play on my phone so I could learn all the learning? Can I have a PDF so I could read it if I want to? And we, we soon realized that if you just spark an interest and then give the learner the options of how they want to learn that topic, most people will then go and learn themselves because A, it benefits them, and B, they can choose the format that they receive that learning in. And it's the same at home, right? Yep. I know some people that will watch a documentary and learn those about a documentary. I know some people that would prefer to listen to a podcast. I know some people that prefer to read a book. They're all learning the same thing, but if you're letting them choose the method of learning, they will choose the one that they prefer and suits them most. And you'll get a, a better uptake if it's tell them why it benefits them. Not why it benefits you as a business. That's irrelevant to people. No one cares. Um, and then give it to them in a format that they can choose and they want to learn in. So that was what we did. And it's the same with at universities, right? I mean, no one wants to sit in lectures half the time. If you can say to people, here's the reading, here's a video you should watch, or here is um, an interactive course that you can do to do the same learning, more people would then go and actually do that, that learning, but they would pick the one that suited them. When they've got time, some people might to dip in, dip out. Some people don't want to sit there for three hours. So that's, that's what companies need to learn. All your training should be in slightly different formats and you need to advertise that training from a learner's perspective. Bingo. I first came across you, Mike, from, uh, I'm reading from my screen here, the video, the Honeypot profile video. I'll, I'll link it below if anybody's not watched it, but two things stood out to me in that video. One, the attention to detail in your videos and then two, not being afraid to say what's on your mind. Um, when the world went fully virtual, a lot of... I keep picking on sales trainers, but they're what I'm surrounded by most. A lot of sales trainers that I see at seminar conferences uh, still use the same camera on their MacBook to train people, still use the same slideshows, um, even though there was a handful of trainers in the network who had provided free or ongoing training to kind of like up level themselves and try to like get like kind of get your shit together to make the experience better for the end user and not just talk uh, because experience is part of the training as well. Um, why do you think going back to the first point where I referenced the attention to detail that you put in the animated cartoons, the lighting, everything, why do you think so few people go to the levels 
that you've gone to and still go to when it comes to production and editing? Um, it's just the, like lazy, isn't it? And it's easy. And, you know, people think I've got a camera on my phone. So they, I'm saying this now, I'm on a webcam. I could be in the studio. I've got a studio next door, but um, it's being used. So, but it's, um, I think it's people just think now, and again, they've been taught anyone can do a podcast, anyone can shoot videos. And you, you can, in theory, much like anyone can play tennis, but, you know, Serena Williams is Serena Williams, isn't she? So, and I think it's that. I just think people are lazy. And there's a few tips that you can do just for shooting your own videos that make them instantly better. I've seen a lot of people shoot videos with a window behind them, with the light coming from behind them. So they're like a silhouette. And there's so many things where you just think basics. Anyone can buy a, a lav mic off um, what you, I mean, you've got a, what's that? A Yeti there, Blue Yeti. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone can buy a mic for like £10 off um, Amazon. That will make a huge difference. Anyone can buy a ring light for £20 to sit to the side that will light you better. There's so many little things you could do. But the reason why in my um, videos that I used to do and like the sales videos I used to do and the recruitment videos, and just my thoughts on business when I started my YouTube channel was my last business, when we created online learning, it was all animated explainer videos. So when we got, when the business got sold, I had that skill set. I wasn't allowed to, so part of my um, the sale was I wasn't allowed to work in uh, that industry for two years. So I had the skill set to do this uh, stuff and I had time on my hands because I didn't have a job. I just had a lot of money and time. So I just thought I want to get better at this stuff. So I just started to try and upskill myself while putting content out. So that's why I did it. Just because I... I I'd learned those skills and I was learning as I went. To be honest, I don't think those videos there are anywhere that near the standard that um, I'm producing now, especially in the um, views of my own um, business community. The content that I'm putting out there now blows that stuff away. Yeah, but it was just different. Not many people had seen animated explainer videos interjected in, in an interview sequence at that time. I'll tell you where I got inspired though. Please remember the um, Ricky Gervais podcast. With, I've never uh, listened to the podcast, but I was yeah, so sure. they had the podcast then. It's just um, Ricky, Stephen, and Carl Pilkinson. It's like the introduction of Carl Pilkinson, basically. Yeah. And they had animated a lot of that, and I thought that was quite good. But to do that, they had a whole team of animators. It would have it would have took about six months per episode if I tried to do it on my own. So I just thought, why don't I just pick out the key parts, animate that to get again my lessons from creating learning content. Once something changes, it, it re-engages people's um, attention. So that was something I learned. So I always try to make something different happen every sort of 10 to 15 seconds, whether it might be a quote would come on screen, whether it would be a graphic would come on, whether it be an animated section for 10, 15 seconds. So it's just that because I knew it retains people's attention. And that, in my view, especially when you're marketing your business or you're trying to sell anything or you're trying to get any message across, that is the most important thing that attention is currency in this day and age i believe if you, you, if you can get people's attention and hold it then nine times out of ten you've got a better chance of closing a sale or working with that person or building an audience agreed and, and attention do you think you would have got as many people's attention if you hadn't have put the time and effort into those videos sprinkled with animation because i know you've got a youtube channel there with eighty thousand plus subscribers and i think a lot of that might come from the effort that you've put into your videos because i know when i first saw it i shared it to three or four of my friends yeah it's um it's 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 the principles i've got to con for content and i explain i explain it so many times to people when i talk to them about their marketing and their sales it's you need to make something that a gets attention but is valuable and is shareable. It's those three things. Now, the problem with a lot of people when they create any content is they are they don't look at it from the viewer's point of view. And I always say it's when you're making content, creating content or whatever, what you need to think of, and it really it ties in with the very first thing I said about um, how do people learn uh, and how do people discover you. You want, you want people to feel like they've discovered you for the first time. You don't want to be forced down someone's throat. And that's why I often say, content marketing and creating videos and putting them on YouTube and putting them so when people search on Google, your videos rank is far better than a Facebook ad. The reason being is a Facebook ad, 
is interrupting somebody's day on a platform that they weren't looking for that content. Yep. Now, the difference between you doing, and I, I spoke to someone recently that said they'd had 18,000 views on their sponsored Facebook ad. It, they were selling a product. And I asked them the numbers and it said they had 130 clicks on the ads and they had 16 people land on the landing page and only two people wow. uh, fill in their details. And then, so, but he was saying, but I had 18,000 views. But I was like, but they're the wrong views. So really 17,998 people didn't, weren't compelled enough to buy what you were selling. When you start making content that is what your ideal client wants and is in the places they are searching for that content, your ideal client is self-qualifying and it becomes an evergreen lead generating piece of content. So that's what I thought with my YouTube channel was, I would just answer a question. So like I said to you before, if you wanted to set your Sky Digital box or if you wanted to roast the perfect turkey, whatever it might be, there's two places you go for that in real life and that is Google or YouTube. They're the only two places you go. And guess what? That is how 99.9% .9 of people in business also do when they've got an issue that needs resolving. Yeah. So I, that was the thought process I put into my YouTube channel was why don't I just answer questions? So when anybody answers that, asks that question on YouTube, my videos would rank. And then it would be answer that question and give value. And if you do that and you do it in a way that's quite engaged and quite funny, I, I like quite like to use humor to get a point across. Some people might not think it's funny, but it, it's, it's trying to be funny and showing the ridiculousness of some things. But the point is, I'm advertising my ability to create content, to get attention, get views, and create engaging content that people like and share. Guess what I sell? I sell in my other business, a content marketing company that can create content for your business. So you've seen my content, you've shared it. There's, there's the proof that it works. The fact that A, you found it, B, you enjoyed it, and C, you've shared it with other people shows you that I can do that for your business because I've done that for mine. So it was like, that was a living, breathing uh, portfolio of my work. And that's all I thought of my YouTube channel as. I didn't think of YouTube as I want to be a YouTuber. I just thought I want to put my content somewhere. So whenever I'm talking to people about sales, marketing, growing a business, scaling a business, do you need a mentor? Any of these things, there's all my content with thousands of views, thousands of followers. So there's the proof that A, I know what I'm talking about. B, it can attract people. And then I also offer content marketing. So I can say, well, there's proof that this method works. Not only did I use it to scale my own business, attract 340 clients in two and a half years with no paid ads on, and I only use LinkedIn by just using that content. You can see it's shareable because it's got millions of views. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of like a living, breathing testimonial of my content. So that's why I did that. But um, when I speak to clients about content, a lot of them say, we want a video. We want a brand video about our business. And I'll, I will ask them what they want. And nine times out of 10, it's, We've been established for 70 years, a combined 70 years experience. We, um, you know, served over 5 million homes last year. And I said, number one, no one cares about you. People only care, can you solve my problem? And they don't care if you've been established two years or 25 years. This is my problem, can you fix it? So if you create content that answers that question and then put it in the places where people genuinely look for answers to questions, I will feel like I've discovered you rather than you selling to me. So that's Number one hurdle sorted. Then if you just give value, I think it's called the law of reciproc... I can't say the word reciprocity. Recipro oh, yeah. I, I, you know. I'm going to say it. I don't know. Yeah. I feel like you've got to reciprocate that. So if I've given you value and I've never actually spoke to you on the phone, but when you've typed in your problem, I've popped up, I've solved that problem, made your life better. Strangely, now you feel like you know me I've done something for you and I've never spoke to you before. So now when we do finally speak or you do get in touch straight away, you feel like I've already enhanced your life or solved your problem or made your life easier or better. So now you're self-qualifying. You've already decided that I'm the person that knows how to solve your problems. I've helped you previously and 
you know what I sound like, you know what I look like, you like my style, my tone of voice, you like my content. So there's no shocks. So once I did that, and this is even in the old business, once I was creating content like that, most business becomes inbound, but videos from two years ago were still getting thousands of views because if you pick your questions right, those videos will always rank. So I've got a video now at the moment, which is um, crypto, crypto for dummies. That video does 7,000 views per day, per day, and it's from 2019. Wow. And, but, and I generate money off that video every single day because I was smart and I've gone, what questions do people want to know around investing, making money, but whatever it might be, I will just make content that answers these questions and give value. But in absolutely none of my videos do I say, come to us for your content marketing. We can do you a package of, at no point do I sell at all. It's, people would come and see me. Can you help my business? What do you do mentoring? Do you do, so anything that I do now is based on people asking me, do I do it? And the answer is yes, I can do that. I can do your marketing for you. I can create this bank of evergreen lead generating content, which acts like a 24 hour a day salesperson that's pitch perfect. If you've got your content in front of your ideal clients, answering the questions they want to hear that is like a pitch perfect sales team that doesn't take a day off and mm. every single time someone searches for that video boom, mine comes up they watch it and i might not get every single person contacted me but i come in on a monday and there's seven or eight inquiries saying i've just seen your video on x that video is three years old that video is two years old and this is where people in their business don't understand marketing and it's they feel like they have to post every day and they have to jump on the latest trend and they have to go, look, here's us, here's us now Christmas jumpers or here's us celebrating Halloween. I call that disposable content. That's content that no one is looking for in July, August, September. What you want to do, the smart thing, and this is the one thing that we did in Learning Heroes better than anybody else and understood better than anybody else is. When we were talking to people on the phone, every time I got asked a question, I would write that question down. Then at the end of the week, I'd have a list of questions I've been asked. If I'd been asked a question, say, five or six times from either a prospect, some, someone that hadn't bought our product but was interested, or an existing client wanted me to explain something, can I help them get a bigger uptake in their learning? Can I help them um, roll out their, their training course? Whatever it might be, I either made a list of those uh, topics, if there was more than five or six times they've been asked, I would then prioritize that as content we needed to make because I knew two things. If I made that content, number one, other people on that buying journey are thinking that same process. So there's content out there now that already answers that question. So people could discover that on their own, get the answer they want, think, ah, oh, that makes sense. That's answered the question I've got. I might speak to this guy. Yes, that's what happened. Or it saves me having to repeat myself over and over again to existing to, to people as well so I could then go oh I'll send you a video on that and I'd send a video or I then built it into when they did sign up here is five videos explaining your frequently asked questions as soon as you do that number one I had to speak to people less it meant that when I did speak to people they were more qualified and it, uh, the third thing was it made the sales cycle smaller uh, shorter sorry so content is like is was key to us being able to grow scale of business. I was the only salesperson in Learning Heroes until six months before we sold. And the reason being is I looked at content and videos as my sales team. So instead of me having to repeat this 200 times a week, I'd make a video for it. And then, oh, I have to answer this question 180 times a week, I'll make a video on it. But at no point did I say, but please buy our products. It was just answer a problem point, uh, answer a pain point you've got, give you value and, Make it funny so it's shareable. And then what you found was, um, I did a video called How to Get Past the Gatekeeper. Yeah. Um, I've got, you know, um, explaining how it happens. The guy's head pops through the phone. The gatekeeper's scared. She's shaking. She's falling over. That video did 1.2 million views in eight days. Whoa. But I only posted it in two places. But what happened was people saw it and, and either thought, this is completely out of order. You shouldn't talk to a gatekeeper like this which was good for me because it meant they'd share it outrage some of the times, but then it, 
the people it did resonate with, your ideal client, were like, no, actually, I disagree with you now. I think that is a good way to get past the gatekeeper. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that did I um that video, that video has probably done maybe three, four million views now, all, all the platforms combined. And that video still wins business for the person that I created that video with uh three years later. So um yeah, that 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 was the that was why I created the content like that. And that is how I use content in my old business. I would say if you're not creating video content as you're frequently asked questions and using it as a way for lead gen and putting it on YouTube. So many businesses aren't on YouTube because they think, well, we don't want a YouTube channel. I don't want to be a YouTuber. It's not that. That's not the reason. The reason is that is where we all know in everyday life, when you've got a question, you either go to YouTube or Google and Google pulls through YouTube videos now. Yeah. So YouTube pulls through. Uh, so if you've not got YouTube videos now, like you're shooting yourself in your foot, you, you, you're trying to do business with one hand side behind your back, I believe. 48 hours. Yeah, but about 48 hours ago, I added a another direct debit to my bank uh, account and it was views are my own um oh, why are you joined I've, I've joined i watched the first video on council culture and enjoyed it thoroughly um for those who don't know what it is rather than me give the 30 second commercial you'll do a better job because it's your baby so the mic is yours Yes. So um, much like this, really, I what I found was I would get asked the same questions every single time. And it was, you know, how did you know who you were going to sell your business to? What was the selling process like? How did you scale your business? What marketing did you do? Um, lots and lots of different <laughs> things like that. And I've always been, I, I used to say, like, I, people would ask me if I could mentor them. And number one, I'd say, I'm too busy working on my own business. So I've not got time to mentor you. And also, um, I, I don't feel like I could necessarily answer every single question that you've got and be able to help you. So what I thought I would do was get in experts that had done the bits that I don't know the answers to and create an online community where I would break down exactly what we've been talking about today about exactly the type of marketing that I did, exactly the kind of strategies that I did with my marketing funnel, my sales funnel, how I used to target people on LinkedIn, how I grew my social media audience to 180,000, how I launched my YouTube channel, um, how I identified any people that I was going to sell the business to, to um, when I was going to do my exit, how I identified any potential clients and prospects. So I thought I would create an online uh, community with a Slack group where I could answer questions. But instead of answering it one-to-one, -one, when I get asked questions now, I will take them and then create the content and Put that out to an audience so it's a very similar kind of model as in create that content once and um it will help multiple people and i feel that's a better way and a lower cost way of being able to do it because for me to mentor someone now i would have gone well this is how much money i would make in my own business per day if i charge you that it'd be a silly amount of money you know like no one wants to pay someone a grand a day for mentoring or something like that so i just thought why don't i create a low cost um community of business owners startup owners entrepreneurs and i would get in guests to talk about specific things based on what that community needs and um so views of my own was born now the reason i called it views of my own was um last year linkedin uh, banned my profile and removed my profile because i got uh, anonymous complaints about some of my content sort of explaining the unhand underhand and shady tactics in marketing and sales so i got banned from linkedin the, that profile was on ninety thousand. so i just called my community views on my own as a bit of a like yeah. to, to LinkedIn. it's a place where you can talk openly and honestly and frank about business i, I think linkedin's gone a little bit to everybody clap everybody be happy it's a wonderful world when the reality is this stuff is hard i'm what I'm explaining to you now it isn't it's not not necessarily going to work 100% of the time it's not necessarily going to be as easy as I've explained to you but people don't want to hear how hard business can be at times you know it's it is a lot of graft it is a lot of the times on the phone it is hearing no a lot of the time um so that's what views my own is so I built a community it's for startups entrepreneurs business people people in marketing and it's to help with marketing sales scaling and growing your social media audience so you can potentially make your business less shit is the tagline. Um, 
and yeah it started quite well we've got uh, about 1200 um people in the free community which is one monthly newsletter yeah and we've got uh nearly 100 on the weekly content in my in my opinion that's the best one yeah um, this week we spoke about creating a marketing funnel similar to what i've spoke about today uh, we've got stuff we're filming some stuff up with sales coming up um and we get people in sales is because weirdly off the back of doing a list and selling my business I, I then started to get asked to do stuff or create content with people from Dragon's Den, um, business people, people that have achieved massive things um, because the story we had creating an eight million pound business in two and a half years is quite unusual, especially because I have no experience in that industry. So I've got like a little black book of contacts that you may, maybe not be able to actually get to speak to yourself or get your question to that person for them to answer specifically. So it's a great way for me to get in some of the contacts that I've got to talk about, you know, how did they create a 2 million pound business? Uh, sorry, a 2 billion pound business. How did they get a million followers on social media? So we can find the tips and tricks from people that have been there and done it basically. But yeah, views are my own dot social. I'll leave, a link. For free. I'll leave a link to it below. I certainly recommend joining. I'm one of those 100 people that are, that are paying at the moment. Um, What's your personal definition of success? It's an interesting one, this. I, the one that everybody says, it, it's money, isn't it? And, and, it, and it's even with opinion. I, I've, I, I've said something recently on Twitter, and someone said, well, he's made more money than you, so what do you know? <laughs> As if because you've made more money than someone, it makes your opinion more valid than somebody else's. Um, so I've had a bit, uh, like recently, I've had a bit of a tough time in terms of like, I've split up my uh, wife after 13 years. I've got two young kids and stuff like that. And that's one thing I think that some people can get lost in. They, they think like, well, I need to achieve this. I need to earn X money. I need to, and they think that that is the thing that's going to solve your problems. Well, if I just add 3 million in the bank or just add 2 million in the bank or 1 million in the bank, these problems that you've currently got are going to disappear, but they don't. And I've learned that probably the hard way. Yeah. And it's not like a sob story and people say, oh, money doesn't make you happy. There is truth in that. If you can be happy with little, you will be happy um, when, when, you, when, you, when you've got a lot. And I was never happy. So I, I'm now just not happy with a lot more money, basically, and a lot more time to think about it. So I would say my definition of success is being able to live life on your terms. So if you only want to work three days a week and you can achieve that, that's success. If you want to be able to pick your kids up from school at three o'clock every day and you are doing that, that is success. I would say there are uh, far more successful people with less money um, knocking about than you'd imagine. But people seem to think success is having a 10 million pound business or whatever. A lot of that stuff stress, dealing with taxes, stress, dealing with capital gains and how much tax you need to pay and your money disappearing in the bank that's all stress and it's things like well i'd love that type of stress it's it's a different type of stress than what you're used to if you're in a position where you've got a regular income coming in every month and it gives you the freedom to be able to pick and choose when you want to switch it off when you want to you know turn it up when you want to take a break you are successful so i would say a lifestyle business that allows you to spend time with the people that you want to spend time with and do the things that you want to do. And I would say I've not achieved that at this point. So I, I wouldn't consider myself successful. I'm someone that's been, that's had a, a successful business and I've successfully grown on social media, whatever you might, you might want to call a launch a YouTube channel. But in terms of my own definition of success, I would say I've, I'm nowhere near it. Hopefully, I will be from there. If you, if you, sorry, you work on <laughs> sorry it. Sorry to make everyone feel bad at the end, but yeah. So, I mean, if I if I knew back then what I know now and I've learned over the last sort of mm. two years, uh, and but you can obviously, I say blame. You can uh, portion some of the blame on COVID, being working from home, so being trapped in a house for two years and not having that release or not being able to go on your two week holiday somewhere where you can escape reality and oh reconnect with your loved ones quite as much you know i didn't do those things for two years like many people and um i would say that's probably been a contributing factor but the real factor i believe is myself i've never really been grateful for what i've got i've always had that drive like no i need i need more 
when I sold my business, believe it or not, I was applying for jobs two weeks after I sold. Just applying for jobs because I can't sit on my hands. I think there's something wrong with me. I need to be doing something all the time. And I need my mind active because as soon as I'm not active, I start thinking about things that make me unhappy. So I was actually applying at, believe it or not, a state agency in Warrington to work there. But unfortunately, because my personal brand and my content have been seen by so many people, especially locally, nobody would employ me because they thought it was some sort of, what's he coming here for? Why does he want to work for us? This is weird. What's his, what's his angle? Mm -hmm. When I literally wanted to learn about property investing. So I thought how better to do it than, like I said, learn on the job, go and work at an estate agent. So whenever, because I would have money in my bank, if ever a house came up that was below market value or needed to be do it, done up, I could basically buy it before it went on right move. That was my actual plan, believe it or not. Mad, isn't it? Just to stay busy, though, or just to stay busy? Like, would you... Two things. Something? Give yeah. me something to do. Well, three things. Give me something to do. I was interested in property. Um, and three was I wanted to be able to see how it works from the inside. Because after going online, I, I get emails all the time saying, this is a great deal. It's 25% below market value. It generates this amount of money. You'd have seen those adverts yeah. or those emails. But I always used to think, if it is 25% below market value and it generates 20, uh, two grand a month profit, why are you selling it to me? Like, why aren't you buying that? And I couldn't get my head around that at first. So um, I thought, why don't I just go and work in a state agents? And I applied at three. I even went for an interview. And she was like, no, it makes me nervous. Number one, you've, your business that you've just sold, you've, you, you've made more money than I make. So why would I want to employ someone that's achieved something I've not achieved, which I thought was a mad mindset anyway. Like, really, I'm sat there. You can ask me questions all day long. Mm -hmm. um, so I offered to work for free and only on commission only. So only pay me on stuff I sell. And still didn't. And it honestly, it was, a, it was a female estate agent from Warrington. She'll know who she was. She actually said, because if you're not there for the salary, genuinely said this, if you're not there for the salary, you can come and go as you please. And I can't make you work days that I want to make, so I won't own you. Jeez. It's a mad mindset, isn't it? That's fucked up. Yeah, mad. So, I, so she was like, because I was like, well, just pay me on what I sell. So it's like risk-free, look at my track record. Like, all you have to, and like, no. I, I, no one would touch me. I, so unfortunately, I'm in an un unemployable position now, especially locally. And uh, with my YouTube content, everyone thinks I'm trying to unearth a scam or trying to show that they're unethical or, or trying to rip people off. It's like, it's kind of, I back myself into a corner a little bit. Perhaps a small percentage, but incredibly loud. Are, are, are of that opinion I'd say the majority uh, look at you as someone they take inspiration from and ideas and oh well thank you appreciate that Except but yeah to anyone out there that if anything I've said today sort of resonates with more interesting or they want to dig a bit deeper like join views of my own and um, you can get part of it like I do Q&A's we do lives you can come into the studio uh, once a month we get someone from the group to come into the studio and me and my business partner we do like a review of their business answer any questions they've got they can be part of the live recording and they can ask their question live so we do loads it's going to be huge this year for us so i've i've, I've got two more questions about one and a half um sounds like you might want to mix in following everton football club as well so your life is all just not business yeah so i get um i get ian says to me he goes like the problem is with Twitter, let's just say Twitter, because I've, I've had to become more active on Twitter since being banned from LinkedIn. So I'm actually making, I'm at weirdly now, and I'll, I will display this in views on my own uh, probably in two months time. I'm following a formula to grow your Twitter following. So what I don't, what I don't like doing is saying, Hey everybody, you should do X when I've never done it myself. So mm -hmm. what I've done is I've been, I've learned this formula to grow your Twitter audience. And I'm actually following that formula at the moment but I can't help myself. So I'm meant to be solely business focused now and solely like, again, giving value and setting your tweets up in a certain way and doing a certain number of tweets per day and doing a certain level of activity. I will see if that works um, and I'll reveal that in a couple of months time. But um, I, I, I'm bang into boxing. I love boxing and I love Everton and sometimes I can't help myself. So sometimes some people reading my Twitter must think, that seems so weird that you're, you're ranting about about 
Rafa Benitez or whatever it might be. Uh, but yeah, so big Everton fan, yeah. You should uh, become mates with Tony Bellew and go for a point. You'll take both boxes in, in that scenario. Yeah, yeah. Um, final question. You said you have two kids. Um, if you, and I'm assuming those kids are under, under the age of 18. Yeah, uh, 11. Uh, my son's 11 tomorrow. Um, my daughter is six. If you could come into the English education system, wave a magic wand and add a mandatory subject to the curriculum, what would that subject be and why? Yeah, it, it would be understanding money. Um, I'll, I'll say one thing. Uh, I've read one, well, there's one book that I always talk about that I think is sort of the biggest influence on my understanding of money. And take about like, my upbringing and going to boarding school and all those things apart. It's called The Rules of Wealth by Richard Templer. And it, there's a new edition of it now, but I've got the old one. It's a hundred, like, rules about money and it's about understanding your ingo uh, your incomings your outgoings your expenses understanding about time for money and stuff like that. and it's really basic to be honest if that was turned into a course uh and someone taught kids that it would it, it would be huge because it's a kind of book that you work through so you can't really read it cover to cover it's yeah. almost like you are up to a certain stage in that book and some of you might be only at stage three and it blows your mind and you're like, oh, well, now I want to work my way through the book. So I was on stage probably about 86, 87 when I sold my business. I was still reading. So I've had that book for 12 years and I still read it now. So I've, I've, I've not finished it, which is mad, isn't it, for a book? And it's you almost like you go back and you read a couple of things. Like, oh, do you know what? I've stopped doing that or I've not done that bit. So it would be explaining money to people, explaining what compound interest means. Like That's the biggest thing ever. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. Um, it's the same with uh, your content's very similar. It's like it, it compounds and it, it, you know, keep doing it. And then all of a sudden you hit a certain point and sky's the limit. But yeah, most people don't understand about com compound interest and don't understand about APR and don't understand about any of these different things or interest rates or um, how you can lose your money leaving in a savings account. It's 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 mad. It's it mad. Uh, you, I think if you left money in a savings account in 2019 and 2020, with, just with interest rate alone, it's like down 650 pounds. Right. So Crazy. the amount, but you can imagine, right? The number of experts that I've met on the school playground since selling my business, and then I would get told every week from people, if I had a million pounds, I'd put it in the bank and live off the interest, and I'd be like. But the fact that you think that is A, the reason why you'd never probably have a million pounds to start with, but B, you don't understand that they seem to think that you put a million pounds in the bank and then you get 80 grand yeah. or 100 grand a year. That's what they believe. When you actually say, well, inflation is eating at, so you're actually losing money with that being in the bank. They can't get their head around it. And I know, I hear people saying, I would buy a care home. I'd offer X amount of... I'd, I'd be I'd give um, donations here there and everywhere you don't it's a weird thing to say when you've not got it but a million pounds is nowhere near as much as you think it is as people think it is um, because the tax man takes a chunk number one I was lucky because there was entrepreneurs relief at the time so I only had to pay 10% uh, on that money but I tell you what 10% of that money is on 8 million is a is a wounder yeah, for sure. Um, oh, and sure. Funny thing about it was, by the way, so, and this is something I'm, I'm, I had to pay uh, HMRC four and a half grand uh, about six weeks ago because my accountant made a mistake on that, ta on that tax return, um, on a nine hundred pounds saving, uh, nine hundred pounds amount of interest that had grown in my uh, uh, ISA. Oh, so. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't bring it up for four and a half years, whatever it might be. And then they've hit me with a four and a half grand bill. And I was there saying, I paid you more tax that year than I've ever paid in my life. And you're now chasing me for four and a half grand. Bearing in mind, in my business, I had 21 employees, yeah. national insurance contributions. They were all paying tax. I think um, it, it's, it's interesting. But yes, the amount of experts that I hear that don't understand money, that are adults, and then you think, what are they teaching their kids? And then they're not getting that education in school either. That would be the course that should be in all schools. But I believe they won't introduce that because I don't want to be like, oh, the system wouldn't work. But 
if more people understood money and understood how wealthy people understand money, then there wouldn't be as many people willing to go and work nine to five. And so it suits the system. The system is set up to create a workforce for the, the few people or the elite that understand these things. And that's why I don't think they ever will introduce that course. But there's enough content online for you to teach yourselves. Sure. So maybe that's the course you need to teach kids to, to, to about self-learning, finding their own um, interests and learning things that are really going to make a huge impact on their life. Playing Pokemon Go isn't going to help your life. Uh, no. I say this to my son now. My son's a goalkeeper. And he would rather go out and play Pokemon Go for like two hours than just spend 25 minutes throwing a ball against his bouncer and doing his catches. And I say, well, what's going to probably help you achieve the thing that you say you want to achieve? You know, but what do I know? I'm a guy that works in an office for a living. And business-wise, you've been remarkably successful and you also sound like a pretty decent dad too. Um, I'll end the interview here because we're up on time. One final thing is I read somewhere oh, back in probably 2018 that if you took all the wealth of the world, put it into one pot, and divided it equally amongst every human being alive, every human being would have 14 million pounds. 14 million? 14 million. Crazy to think about. That is mad, isn't it? It is. Mike... Yeah. It's 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 been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, I wish you continued success personally and professionally. Uh, I hope yeah. everything don't get relegated this season. Maybe you'll be a mate with Tony and, and have a pint with him as well. And, and I hope views are out, are your own grows to a thousand members in the next year as well. That's the that's the target. One thousand. I'm putting it out there now. Manifest it. You know what is it? Law of attraction. <laughs> Fuck that. It's the law of action. So I need to get on and get those people signed up. So hopefully, Excellent. if you've seen this, you enjoy this. You like anything I've said. Come and join views on my own dot social. All links are below and I'll let you go and uh, take that action there, man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much.